All right, everybody, it's 2 p.m. So we are going to get started. So once again, thank you all for joining us for this webinar. Um, like I said earlier, it's going to be about 45 minutes to an hour long. Um, and this is going to, as always, be a PG program. So please keep any comments or questions you have appropriate and on topic. Um, you can send your questions to the Q&A. I have my friend Amanda here. She will be moderating that box. Um, we will also be using the chat box in the very beginning. And after that, I will disable it. All right, so to get into this, we are going to be discussing life cycles today. And so to start us off, I wanted to use our chat box. So if you could head to that, um, my question that I want you to answer is what kind of animal you think could have a life cycle that lasts 30 to 40 days? And also what kind of animal you think would have a life cycle that can last 10,000 or more years? So I'll give everyone about 30 seconds to a minute to submit any guesses that they have and then we'll discuss it. All right, so at this point, if no one else is going to guess, we're just going to stop here. Oh, perfect. Okay, even more. So we've got some that think that I'm guessing the 30 to 40 day life cycle could belong to a butterfly. I'm seeing uh, maybe for a fish um, for the 10,000 plus years, someone said an immortal jellyfish. That would be super awesome. Um, and someone even put in the fact that some parrots can live to about 100 years. So all really good guesses. At this time, I am now going to turn off the chat box. So if you have any more questions or comments, leave them in the Q&A. And especially for comments, if you can hold those um, and possibly just put those in your evaluations after the webinar, that would also be helpful. All right, so the 30 to 40 day life cycle, that is actually going to belong to the common housefly, so a type of insect whereas the 10,000 plus year life cycle is going to belong to an animal that most people don't know is an animal. So this one belongs to a deep sea glass sponge. Sponges are considered animals, but there is a huge variety in their life cycles as can be seen just in the time frame that they occur in. So the goal of this presentation is to introduce you all to some exciting and lesser known life cycles and reproductive strategies. Um, but I also hope this leaves you with a better understanding of and curiosity towards the huge amount of diversity in the animal kingdom. So moving forward, the beginning of this presentation is gonna focus more on a general overview of life cycles. Um, and then we will transition into a more in-depth look at various life cycles and reproductive strategies found in insects, amphibians, fish, reptiles, birds, and finally mammals. All right, so to start us off, we must first know what a life cycle is. A life cycle is the series of developmental uh, stages that an organism goes through during its lifetime. And a lifespan is how long it takes to complete a life cycle. Now, how long an animal's lifespan is and how their life cycle progresses is going to depend on their reproductive strategies. These are traits and behaviors that promote successful reproduction and survival of offspring. So these can also be called um, reproductive adaptations. Um, but in nature, there are two main patterns that are found throughout our groups of animals. The first being that animals with shorter lifespans tend to be smaller in size as adults. So they're going to produce a lot of young and they're gonna provide their young with very little care. An example of an animal that follows this pattern in Nevada is our muskrat. These are small semi-aquatic rodents that are going to have about 30 young every single year. And these young are going to be born blind and helpless. They're also pretty, pretty much naked. And within a month, they are able to be weaned from their mother, meaning they no longer require her breast milk and they will become independent so that she can make room for another litter. So the other pattern is opposite where animals with longer lifespans tend to be larger in size as adults. So they're going to have fewer young and they tend to provide their young with much more paternal care or parental care. 
An example uh, of an animal that does this in Nevada is going to be our mountain goats. So female mountain goats are called nannies and they tend to have a single kid during their breeding season. Sometimes they have twins and their kids are usually weaned within a few months. So despite the fact that they stop um, requiring breast milk after a couple months, they're usually going to stay with their mother for an additional, co additional couple of months. Um, and then when the next breeding season comes around, usually the kid will leave. But if it, the conditions are not right for their mother to have an additional baby, she will keep that kid from the previous year and help raise it for an additional year. So a general timeline for life cycles. All of them are going to begin with birth. They will then progress through um, younger juvenile stages that require a lot more growth. Um, typically, once they are done growing, they are going to be focusing on reproduction and then they are eventually going to die. And so depending on the animal, the timeline of their life cycle is going to be different. And some animals are going to have more simple and some are going to have more complex life cycles. So animals with simple life cycles tend to have fewer stages. Um, their stages don't necessarily last a long time and they don't involve really complex um, processes. Whereas complex li life cycles, on the other hand, are gonna have generally more stages. Um, they not necessarily always have more stages, but their stages are always going to be a little bit more complicated. And sometimes they're gonna involve things like a metamorphosis. And a metamorphosis is a big change in an animal's body and its behaviors. And this can be in the form of changing physical structures on the outside of the animal. It can also involve changes in internal body chemistry. Um, and some animals that are going to undergo a metamorphosis are amphibians, insects, and fish. So now that we've covered the basics of life cycles and some other terms like reproductive strategies and metamorphosis, we're now gonna get into um, our different groups of animals and what type of life cycles and reproductive strategies they have. So we are going to start with our incomplete metamorphosis within our insects life cycles. So incomplete metamorphosis means that the insect is not going to undergo a very large structural change and it's not going to occur during their pupil stage. So insects with incomplete metamorphosis will only have three stages, egg, larva, and adult. They don't have that pupa stage in between the larva and adult. And their growth is marked by instars usually. So our, an instar is going to mark when an insect is going to be molting. So their first instar begins as they exit their egg and it ends as they begin their first molting. So to give you an idea of what molting looks like, here is a cicada that is molting from its, its exoskeleton. Um, and they're usually going to go through a couple molts um, during their larval phase until they can finally get to their adult size and adult structure. Um, and these exoskeletons, as they continually molt them, they're eventually going to develop wings in our winged insects. And so besides cicadas, there's also many other species that go through incomplete metamorphosis. Um, it's about 10% of all insects on Earth. So this includes also katydids, which this is a Mormon cricket, and they are not actually crickets. They are katydids, and they are found in Nevada. Also more primitive species like dragonflies, as well as stink bugs, and our mayflies and stoneflies. Now complete metamorphosis. This is going to be a four stage um, life cycle and the metamorphosis is going to occur during the pupa stage. So you can see on this diagram that chrysalis is the pupa stage for our butterflies. Um, for moths, we usually call the structure they make a cocoon. And while they are in this stage, they are essentially going to turn into soup and lose all their structure so that they can rebuild it back into their adult form, which depending on the bug, it's going to be different. So we have many butterflies, so like this monarch butterfly, which are found in Nevada. Also bugs like ladybugs and other beetles will have complete metamorphosis, as well as all flies and wasps and bees. So now getting into our insect reproductive strategies. 
So the majority of insects are not going to invest much parental care in their young, um, especially after they lay their eggs. They typically abandon them. But there are some insects that are going to put in a lot of effort even before they lay their egg. So an example in Nevada are our tarantula hawks, which is a type of parasitic wasp. And what they are going to do in order to protect and give their baby the best place to go through its larva and pupa stage and metamorphosis is they are going to seek out a desert tarantula as the host. So the females will go out in the desert and find migrating tarantulas or tarantulas looking for mates. Sometimes they even coax them out of their burrows. And once they make contact, a very extreme wrestling match ensues that usually results in the female wasp singing the tarantula which is really incredible because the tarantulas are about eight times bigger than the tarantula hawk wasps. Um, but once the wasp stings the spider, they become paralyzed because they have a specific venom in their stinger. And this allows the female wasp to drag that giant body back to the nesting burrow that she has created for her young. And once she has put the tarantula um, in the burrow, she will then deposit a single fertilized egg in the tarantula's abdomen. So keep in mind the tarantula is still alive and at this point the uh, female is going to leave and uh, cover back up the burrow and allow the egg to then go into its larval form and pupate. And when it's in its larval form it's going to be feeding off of uh, the tarantula which is interesting because um, even though they are not taught this by their parents, the larvae know to avoid the vital organs right away so as to keep the tarantula alive as long as possible. And once the larva has eaten enough and grown enough, it will then pupate inside the abdomen of the tarantula. At this point, the tarantula is dead. Um, and after that, they will emerge then as a beautiful adult tarantula hawk wasp, um, ready to go carry out that creepy life cycle once again. Moving on to amphibians. There's many groups of amphibi amphibians, but we are going to talk about frogs and toads and salamanders and newts today. And so for frogs and toads, there are about 6,000 or more species that are going to start off their life cycle as eggs. And the majority are going to start off in these really big clumps of eggs um, that are found usually in water. And so for frog metamorphosis, that's going to occur during their larval stage, which is known as their tadpole stage. Um, at this point, they are going to have gills and a tail that they need to lose. And so as they progress through their larval stage and their metamorphosis, they will lose those things and then they will generate um, a new set of lungs and they will also start developing their legs. And frogs tend to develop their back legs first, so you can see their are much more developed in that picture. Uh, once these frogs have lost their tails and are able to come on land, they are considered froglets. And after that stage, they become adults like this northern leopard frog. For salamanders and newts, their life cycles can be a little bit different and they're gonna have quite a bit of variance. So most of our salamanders and newts are also gonna start off as these big egg masses. And the majority of the salamanders that go through a metamorphosis are going to have aquatic larvae. So if their larva is not aquatic, they do not go undergo a metamorphosis. And in the metamorphosis of the aquatic larva, they are like the frogs going to lose their gills and they are going to develop lungs and legs. And so depending on the species of salamander, adults will be either fully terrestrial um, or semi-terrestrial they can also be fully aquatic. So the salamander on top is a western tiger salamander. Those tend to be more terrestrial. Whereas on the bottom, that is a paddle-tailed newt, which is an aquatic species. So moving on to some of their reproductive strategies and examples of parental care. Um, we said that a lot of salamanders are going to lay their eggs in those huge clumps. Um, but they don't always. So a great crested newt is a type of salamander that is actually going to wrap individual eggs in leaves. Um, that's going to provide better camouflage and protection from predators, and it's also going to help to keep the eggs moist. But the majority of our salamanders are going to lay their eggs in those big blobs. 
Um, they can lay them on land or in the water, um, but most of the time they're laid in the water. Um, and these blobs are super special because what is keeping them together, all those eggs, is a jelly-like substance. And this jelly um, is going to protect them because it helps them to retain their moisture, but it's also going to sometimes be toxic and so predators won't be able to eat them. Another form of parental care in salamanders is egg guarding. So this is a brown-backed salamander that not only guards its eggs, but it typically will wrap its body around them. Um, that can protect them from predators, of course, but it also can protect them from fungal infections. And then, as we said earlier, there's going to be some salamanders um, that are oddballs and either don't go through a metamorphosis or don't have a larval stage at all, or maybe they retain their larval stage. So an example of that are axolotls. They are a species of salamander in Mexico that stay in their larval stage um, into their adulthood. And the reason we think they do this is because they are going to be one of the highest uh, producers of eggs. So aquatic salamanders produce the most eggs out of all different kinds. And it's much easier to put more energy into making eggs if you don't have to put energy into developing all these different body parts. So we have those aquatic salamanders. There's also going to be salamanders that give live birth on land. So fire salamanders are an example. Um, they are going to have eggs that are going to incubate inside and then hatch inside of them so that when their babies are born, they're born live and they're going to look like mini versions of the adults. So typically they are abandoned after they are born because they're developed enough they can survive on their own. So now our frogs and toads, they are also going to have a variety of strategies um, and modes of parental care. So for example, our Pacific chorus frog is going to create these huge blobs of its eggs. Um, and that can be helpful in that um, if a frog is going to come back to guard its eggs, they know where all of them are, they're in one spot. That can also be detrimental though, um, if a predator comes across this egg mass as they're likely to then consume all the eggs. We also have species that are going to uh, lay their eggs in a line of jelly. So that can help them to better camouflage with certain aquatic vegetation and will provide protection from predators. Um, the western toad is an example from Nevada that does this. But worldwide, there are many more uh, different types of strategies and ways that parents try to protect and take better care of their young. So some frogs are going to create these bubble nests. So those are going to help protect them from predators and retain their moisture. Others are going to wrap their eggs in leaves like the great crested newt we talked about earlier. And then there's way, way more. Some that I like to get into are the brooding frogs. So brooding is when you allow your lung to develop inside of your body. So we have gastric brooding frog. This is a species that's actually extinct now. But when it was alive, how it would brood its young is it would do it in its stomach. And so when they were brooding, they would not eat in order to protect their young. But this would also protect them because their parent always knows where the babies are. Um, it's also a form of clutch insurance as if the babies are lost, the parent knows um, and they can go out and have more babies. Whereas if they weren't keeping an eye on their young, they wouldn't know that and it could be a loss for the season. Another brooding frog is the Darwin frog, which broods its young in its vocal sacs um, near its vocal cords. So that's another interesting adaptation. And then lastly, there are these really cool robber frogs that are found in Ecuador and South America. And they are really special because their tadpoles develop inside of them so that when they are born, they are born as froglets. So they bypass that metamorphosis that occurs outside the body. So now we are going to move on to our fish. And fish are going to have a pretty similar life cycle, but some are going to go through different metamorphoses and some might go through multiple. So a general timeline for fish, they're going to generally start off as eggs. 95% of fish are born from eggs. Um, and in the case of our larval metamorphosis, this is going to occur during their hatchling and larval stage. 
So a lot of the time this is going to happen in trout, salmon, as well as flounders and flatfish. And in salmon and trout, the larval stage is where they are called alvin. So they are going to have this yolk sac that is attached to them and that they must um, use up in order to develop into a fry. So at that point, when they are a fry, they're going to look more like they're adults. But in that larval stage, they really don't even look like a fish. So they have to go through that metamorphosis in order to get into their adult form. In flounders, this is a little bit different. So their metamorphosis occurs um, when their eyes and their, and their nostrils are transferred from both sides of their face to one side of their face. So it's a little bit different in different kinds of fish. And then secondary metamorphosis is going to involve um, going in between saltwater and freshwater habitats. So it's going to um, involve changes in internal body chemistry. And this is typically found in eels and salmon. Um, not all salmon though are going to go through that metamorphosis as not all salmon are going to be going in between saltwater and freshwater. And most of the time when they do that, it's because they are spawning which brings us to our first reproductive strategy in fish. Spawning is the simultaneous release of eggs and sperm in large quantities and usually in smaller areas. Um, and spawning is really beneficial for many fish because it enhances the chance of fertilization. So with spawning, you don't have to go find a mate. You're basically guaranteed that your eggs will be fertilized or that your sperm will fertilize somebody's eggs. Um, the downside of this is that um, there's so many things going on that fish generally ab abandon parental care afterwards. It's hard to keep track of which eggs um, are yours and if they're fertilized. So some fish are going to put in a little bit more parental care either before spawning um, and sometimes even after. So in salmon and trout, they will build these little nests in the gravel at the bottom of rivers and lakes where they spawn. Um, these are called reds and they'll help protect their young. There are also catfish species that are going to guard their eggs and some will even stay and guard their larva. This is a bullhead catfish. We do have channel catfish in Nevada that are going to guard their eggs though. And then like I said earlier, not all salmon will undergo that secondary metamorphosis. So kokanee salmon are an example of that. They are a landlocked species, meaning they don't go to the ocean. Um, but they do undergo migrations in order to spawn. And so despite the fact that they're not going in between different habitats, they are um, putting in effort in terms of traveling to Lake Tahoe where they are usually going to spawn. Um, there's also other species of fish in Nevada that spawn. In fact, most of our fish species do. This includes our kiwi, our Lahontan cutthroat trout, and many of our minnow species like our daces. In fact, many minnows can actually spawn um, once a week during their spawning season. Uh, most people think that fish can only spawn once and then they die. That's the least common form of spawning and that tends to occur um, in species that are going to produce the most eggs and are also going to undergo the longest migrations for their spawning. So some last reproductive strategies for fish that I wanted to touch on. Um, one is sex switching. So some fish are able to switch between sexes, meaning that they are hermaphrodites. They have both uh, sexes reproductive organs. An example of this are our clownfish. So normally in clownfish pairs, if one parent dies, they will switch sex. So in males, if their female partner dies, they will generally change back into a female and then seek out another male partner. So very different than what we saw in Finding Nemo. There's also live birth amongst fish. So that's going to usually be in our rays and in our sharks. Um, they tend to be fed through an amniotic sac, which is going to help nourish them and allows them to develop more so that when they're born, they're typically independent. And then we also have mouth brooding fish. So none of these are in Nevada, but there are jawfish and cardinal fish that are going to do this. These are more ocean dwelling fish and they're going to let their young, their larva brood inside of their mouths. So once again, brooding is going to provide a little bit more protection um, as they can keep a better eye on their young and their development as well. 
We're now moving on to reptiles. Reptiles are not going to undergo a metamorphosis. So some fish do, some frogs and toads, some salamanders do, but no reptiles will undergo a metamorphosis. They do not have a larval stage. And the reproductive strategies we're going to touch on are egg laying, live birth, and cloning. So starting with egg laying, this is going to be the majority of snakes and lizards. Um, and they're going to start off in these eggs that are going to be somewhat similar to birds, but a little bit different. So the baby inside there is going to be fed through a yolk sac, which is similar to birds. The main difference is that the outside of the egg is protected by a leathery skin instead of by that harder calcium shell. Um, and this is going to be watertight, so it's going to help retain the moisture levels within the egg better. Um, and it's also going to provide a little bit more thermal protection, um, which is especially helpful as once the eggs are born, they, the babies need to be as developed as possible because they are typically abandoned. So a lot of reptiles will put in parental care in terms of incubating their eggs or maybe even creating burrows but once they have hatched, most are abandoned. And so in Nevada, we have collared lizards that are going to lay eggs. Also, our gopher snakes will do this. And our state reptile, the desert tortoise. Um, and desert tortoises are really long-lived and really large species. Um, and they're gonna put in a little bit of parental care in terms of creating burrows, though besides that, they don't um, necessarily do anything that's more intense. Whereas American alligators are a very large reptile that's going to put in much more parental care. And they also live for a long time too. So our alligators are going to not only um, incubate their eggs, they're also going to perform nest maintenance. Um, and once their babies have hatched, they will transport them and defend them for about a year. So moving on to live birth, we have um, a number of reptiles that do this in Nevada, and they can do this in two different ways. So the first way is through an amniotic-like sac, so kind of similar to the sharks and stingrays. Um, some snakes um, and lizards can be fed through an amniotic sac within their mother. Um, generally, when they do this, they're able to develop more so that when they're born, they are typically abandoned. Um, and this is going to occur in our garter snakes as well as our rattlesnakes. The second way that snakes and lizards can give live birth, birth is by hatching their eggs inside of them so that their babies are born live. So kind of like how we said the fire salamander is going to give birth earlier. So they develop and incubate the eggs inside of them. Um, once the babies are ready to hatch, they're going to hatch still inside the mother and then come out um, as live babies. So this is going to happen in our rubber boas also our rosy boas, our western banded geckos, and our desert horny toads. So the last reproductive strategy we'll talk about in reptiles is female cloning. And female cloning is really useful reproductive strategy, especially if you are an animal that lives in a harsh environment, so especially places like the desert. Um, it's also useful because then you don't have to seek out a male to help to mate with. And so in Nevada, we do not have any species that are capable of female cloning, but we do have a species that helped create a female cloning lizard. So in Nevada, we have our Western whiptail lizard. Whiptails are a group of lizards that are really well known for their female cloning and have quite a bit um, of diversity in their reproductive strategies in general. But our Western whiptail was at one point around a little striped whiptail, and they hybridized to create a New Mexico whiptail, which is the state reptile of New Mexico. So this New Mexico whiptail is a all-female species. There are no males, um, but actually all of the females are genetically distinct, and that's because of this crazy uh, process that they go through while um, the females are going to not fertilize their own eggs. So if you want to look that up, you can, but it's really, really interesting and intense. All right, so now our birds. So birds are going to be born from eggs, of course, 
Um, there are some birds that are capable of that female cloning, so like turkeys and chickens, but most other birds are not able to reproduce that way. Um, and so they're going to produce eggs that must be fertilized by a male bird. Um, in addition, most birds are going to put in more parental care compared to our fish, our amphibians, and our insects. And so birds are going to start their development within their eggs. Like we said, their eggs are similar in structure to reptiles because the young are fed um, with a yolk-like substance and are protected by membranes. But um, their shells are different in that they're harder and they are made more so of calcium. And so they're going to need a little bit more protection in terms of incubation. But once the birds are hatched, they are going to be a little bit different in their development. So there's two classifications for how developed our birds are at their birth. Um, one is altricial. So these are birds that are going to be born naked. Um, they tend to be blind, so they can't see. And they're generally just really helpless. They can't really do much. They are very much reliant on their parents. An example of that are these house sparrow babies. And these are actually a couple days old. So they have more feathers than what they did when they were born. Whereas precocial birds are going to be born with some feathers. Their eyes are open so they can see. They can generally walk around right away. And some of them can even um, feed on adult foods right away. So this is going to be more so found in our raptors, um, also our game birds, and our waterfowl. Um, but despite how developed our chicks are at hatching, all birds have to develop to their fledgling stage before they become adults. Um, and this is typically going to occur during the springtime. This is when people will be finding um, little baby birds that they think have fallen out of their nest and have been abandoned. Usually these are just birds that are fledgling. So they are fledging, they are going to be trying to strengthen their wings so that they can eventually fly. And once they've done that, um, they will usually within a couple of weeks, leave their parents some will go seek out territories, others will just go try to find mates, um, but eventually they will then repeat that life cycle. So birds are also going to have a number of interesting reproductive strategies and examples of parental care. So some of the best known ones are their nest building and egg incubating. In terms of nests, depending on how the babies are developed at birth, that can impact what kind of nest they are going to be using. So for example, our peregrine falcons are going to have precocial babies that are going to be born with some fluff um, and a little bit more protection. So as you can see, this peregrine falcon just laid its eggs on the edge of a building. It didn't really put much effort there. Whereas this songbird below is an oriole and they like to create these big hanging baskets that are almost like hammocks. Um, but they can also have false doors. So a predator may try to come in and find the babies, um, but they will create false doors so that they end up in a dead end and the babies are still safe inside. With egg incubating, the amount of incubating and which parent is going to do it kind of depends on the species. So in especially monogamous species, that meaning that the pairs breed for life, um, the female tends to incubate while the male defends the territory and will sometimes bring food back to the female. Um, in other species, it depends. Um, another really cool bird um, or group of birds are megapodes, and these are mound building birds. They incubate their eggs a little bit differently. Um, they're going to create these huge mounds of vegetation and soil that when heated up by the sun are going to act as like an incubating oven with those eggs inside. And so megapodes sometimes will stick around and watch to, um, to see if their eggs hatch, but most are going to um, abandon their eggs after they put them in there. That way they have more energy to spend on having more babies or doing other things. And then with food gathering, so we said that some precocial species are able to eat their adult diet right away. So like our chucker and a lot of our game birds, um, they may need to be shown what foods to eat at first, but after that they will be able to eat adult foods on their own. Whereas other birds are going to need regurgitation at first. And so this is typical in species that eat harder foods. So for example, in our owls, they will sometimes try to partially digest the food and then regurgitate back up 
the rest for the babies so that they don't have to try to digest the bones or anything, which they're unable to anyways. Other species like house finches and other finches are going to be eating hard foods like seeds. And so they have to uh, crush these up and regurgitate them to their young, not only to feed them, but also so that they can pass helpful gut bacteria that will allow them to digest those seeds on their own later in life. And then also this regurgitation practice is very helpful in long distance travelers. So if you think about emperor penguins, the parents have to travel really far distances um, from the ocean back to their colony um, in order to feed their young. And so it's much easier to transport the fish that they're bringing um, as they are stored inside their crop and then regurgitated to their young once they make it there. So two last reproductive strategies in birds I want to talk about are cooperative breeding and brood parasitism. And these are good examples of selflessness versus selfishness in nature. In Nevada, we have species like acorn woodpeckers and a couple species of swallows. I believe this is from a barn swallow colony. Um, and they are cooperative breeders, meaning that juveniles and non-breeding adults are going to assist the breeding adults um, in caring for their young. So that can mean that they're going to help with building nests, um, defending nests, as well as bringing the young food, um, things like that. On the opposite end, there are birds that are extremely selfish and they are called brood parasites. Um, these are birds that are going to leave their eggs in the nests of other species. So in Nevada, we have brown-headed cowbirds that do this. And they're going to leave their eggs in all different kinds of species nests. These two are warbler parents that adopted these cowbird babies, which you can see the cowbirds are much larger than the adult warblers, and yet the warblers still will uh, raise the cowbirds as their own. We're not sure if they necessarily can't recognize them, um, or maybe their maternal instinct is just so, so strong that they feel like they must take care of their young. But sometimes this can be detrimental as we have found that some warblers will give preferential treatment to the cowbird babies because they're bigger, that tells their parents that they're more likely to survive. So sometimes um, cowbirds, even though their brood parasitism is good for them, it can be detrimental to other birds' populations. So now we're going to move on to our last group of animals, our mammals, and there are three different kinds. There are placental mammals, marsupials, and egg-laying mammals. So the first we will talk about are our placental mammals. And this is the most diverse group of mammals with about 4,000 species worldwide. Uh, the most diverse groups within them are rodents and bats. But in Nevada, we have quite a few different kinds of placental mammals. We have bears, badgers, some porcupines, skunks, all kinds. Um, but even though there's all these different representatives of placental mammal species, they're all going to have the same type of life cycle. So they're all going to start as an egg that is fertilized within their mother. That egg um, that is fertilized will then develop into an embryo. And that embryo is going to be um, nourished through a structure called a placenta. So that's where they get their name, placental mammal, is this structure. It's a spongy kind of structure that passes oxygen and all these nutrients between the mother and the fetus. And typically the larger um, placental mammal, the longer it's going to stay in its mother's womb. So for example, elephants are going to stay um, within their mother's womb for much longer than one of those muskrats we were talking about earlier. But once they have emerged, they will be born live and they cannot be abandoned right away because all mammals require milk from their mothers when they are born. So that kind of gets into their reproductive strategies and how much parental care they put in. Um, so compared to a lot of other animals, in fact, most other groups of animals, mammals are gonna have fewer offspring, they're gonna have longer lifespans, and they're in, gonna invest more parental care in their young. And so this is seen just in the fact that they can't abandon their young right away, like a lot of our fish and reptiles and amphibians, um, and that's because their young are dependent on them for a certain amount of time as they breastfeed. But besides that, they also, uh, mammals have very complicated lifestyles and a lot of the time, juveniles need to learn quite a few things before they're ready to be independent. 
So for example, our North American beaver in Nevada are going to stay in family groups for a couple of years, and most North American beavers are going to do this, not just in Nevada. But they're going to stay with their family units for a couple of years. The juveniles not only are going to help raise the um, younger beavers, which are called kits, but they also need to learn other things from their parents. So for example, they need to learn how to cut down trees, how to do that in the safest way possible, and then how to transport that wood. Also how to use that wood. So how to put together their dams and their lodges to create a safe home environment. And then also animals like beavers do not, other animals and beavers do not hibernate. And so if you're going to be surviving a winter, you're probably gonna to need to have your parents there the first time around to show you what to do. So how to store food, how to stay warm, all those types of things. So moving on to our marsupial life cycles. Marsupials are distinguished by other mammals because most of their development occurs outside of their mother's body. And it's usually going to occur in a pouch for the most of the baby's life. So as you can see from this graphic, kangaroos are marsupials, also wallabies, Tasmanian devils, um, and many other species in Nevada, or not in Nevada, in Australia are considered marsupials. We have one species that has been found in Nevada, though it doesn't have an established range here, and that's the Virginia opossum. Um, but before we get into that, our marsupials are going to start off as these tiny little pink babies that are going to be born prematurely, so much sooner than placental mammals. And when they're born, they tend to be naked, blind, and they only have partially formed hind legs. They do have very well formed uh, forelimbs and claws though, um, which enable them to crawl up their mother's stomach and enter her pouch where they will breastfeed and continue their development for as long as possible. So this is that example of a marsupial that can be found in Nevada. I've been mostly seeing records around Las Vegas. Um, but they can have those tiny little babies that are going to stick in their pouch for a while. Eventually, marsupial babies will start to venture out once they get large enough. Um, and after a couple months, they typically become independent and will leave their parents. And so marsupial reproductive strategies and parental care is going to depend mainly on the type of pouch the marsupial has. So different species have different kinds of pouches and it kind of, and they're going to go along with the reproductive strategies. So kangaroos are a very large species and they tend to have fewer young. So like that pattern in nature, um, but their young are going to grow and eventually get bigger. So what they have as a pouch is they have an extremely large pouch that's able to hold that, not only that newborn kangaroo, but also the kangaroo throughout its development until it's ready to um, be independent, actually. So they can stay in that pouch the entire time, which is going to be much safer than in being left in a burrow or being left somewhere else while your mother goes out and does things. On the opposite end, there are going to be marsupials like our Virginia opossum, which are going to be smaller in size as adults, and they tend to have a lot more babies. And so their pouches are also smaller since their bodies are smaller. Um, and so as their young develop, they actually have to transfer them to nests that they must make. So some marsupials don't have to invest that type of parental care in terms of making nests, but Smaller ones like the Virginia opossum must do that because they can't carry around that many babies um, and still forage and do all the things that the mothers need to do. So now the last group of animals we're going to talk about are monotremes and these are egg laying mammals. Um, so there's five species of monotremes in the world with the best known being the platypus. The other four are different kinds of echidnas, which is kind of like a little anteater slash hedgehog looking thing. Um, but they have a number of characteristics that are similar amongst reptiles, birds, and mammals. So in terms of reptiles, our male platypus are going to have a um, spur on the back of their heel that is going to have venom. Um, they use that for defense as well as sometimes um, when they are fighting over mates. Um, we also are going to see some bird-like properties in our 
monotremes, um, basically in the fact that they're going to have eggs. And these eggs are going to be more similar to our birds than they are going to be to the reptiles. They have a harder shell, more like our bird's eggs. And then like mammals, they are going to have to breastfeed their babies when they are born. So they cannot be abandoned right away. Um, when they are born, they are a little bit underdeveloped. So not as much as our marsupials, but definitely not as well developed as our placental mammals. Um, and they're going to be a little bit different because uh, monotremes do not have nipples, so they do not lactate in the same way that our placental or our marsupial mammals do. They actually have sweat, they sweat milk from patches on their stomachs, and that's how their babies are going to feed um, on their mother's breast milk. So their reproductive strategies. Echidnas are not as well known um, in terms of their reproductive strategies, but they do exhibit a number of things that show that they put in more parental care. So for example, echidnas are going to usually only produce one baby when they reproduce. Um, so that allows them to invest a lot of parental care in that one young and ensure its survival. Um, usually the egg is going to be incubated inside of a pouch that the echidna has um, for as long as possible. Um, but she will eventually make a little burrow that she will store her egg and her newborn in. Um, that will serve as protection, though she doesn't put a whole lot of effort into creating a burrow. They tend to be pretty shallow. But echidnas are going to have those spines. So typically, once the baby echidnas have those spines, they are able to defend themselves a little bit more. So they don't necessarily need as extensive a burrow as, say, the platypus. Um, but our echidnas are typically going to breastfeed their babies up until about seven or eight months, which is quite a long time. Um, and usually around that time is when they become independent as well. So they are weaning almost all the way up to when they're independent for a long while. Um, and once they leave around eight months, they're actually not gonna reproduce until they are around three years old. So echidnas have a longer lifestyle and they take longer to develop um, into their adulthood so that they can reach their sexual maturity and continue that life cycle. Platypus are similar in a lot of their reproductive care, so they're also going to be born from eggs. Um, so part, part of their parental care is just incubation, um, but platypus are going to put in a little bit more effort with their burrows. So they're going to dig much deeper burrows that have a really nice nesting area that they line with different plants and different materials that are going to create a nice safe and soft environment um, and typically they have tunnels that when they leave their burrow and they leave their babies there they're going to seal up those tunnels to prevent any predators from getting access to their young and platypus are going to breastfeed for generally two to three months um, so a lot less time than what the echidna takes to breastfeed um, and at that time, they're usually going to then leave the burrow. So once they're done breastfeeding, they leave their burrow and they're going to learn how to swim as well as eat more adult foods like things like worms. Um, and eventually around three years old, they will also reproduce. So around seven or eight months, they will leave their parents and then just stake out their own territories um, continue their development until they're about three years old. That is when they're going to be sexually mature enough that they can reproduce. All right, so that is going to be the end of our presentation. I wanted to thank you all for your attendance and your participation, and I really hope you enjoyed this presentation and are left with a greater understanding of animal diversity and how reproductive strategies and um, life cycles are going to enhance reproductive success. So if you have any feedbacks or comments about this presentation, please include them in your post-webinar evaluations. Um, as I'm always looking to improve my presentations and my teaching, so I'd super appreciate that. Um, if you want to stick around, Amanda and I will likely hang out for a couple minutes in case there are any questions that need to be answered. Um, but if not, once again, we'd like to remind everyone to remember to stay home for Nevada at this time and enjoy this beautiful weather responsibly.
All right, hello, Scout. It looks like we have one question. Um, the question is, do frogs throw up their eggs? <laughs> so um, as far as I know, they are not going to throw up their eggs. If they're talking about um, the brooding frogs, so they are not necessarily going to be throwing up the eggs, but the gastric brooding frog, those eggs will develop into larva and then into froglets. So technically they're throwing up froglets. All right, it looks like our only question. Um, so if anyone else has any questions, this is now the time to an or ask them. All right, so it looks like we are mainly getting comments and thank you guys all so much for your positive um, reactions to this performance. Absolutely. Yeah, we are very happy to be able to present to you guys and keep um, teaching everyone about the wildlife, not only of Nevada, but just general diversity across the world. Definitely. So when you're also um, doing any of your evaluations, if you have any topics too that you would like to hear about in the future, um, you can include those. That way we are getting um, as much material out to you as possible that is relevant to what you want to know. Um, and then also for future webinars, you can sign up for them at our Facebook link, which I've included on this slide. Um, and you can also watch past recorded webinars on our YouTube. Um, there is a webinar playlist there that you can find all of our past webinars at. But once again, thank you for everyone that attended. Um, I'm going to stop the meeting now. So if you have any more questions, please email me um, at the email at the bottom of the screen.